Okay, then. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to everyone who's joined in while we wait for others to come along. And welcome to the second episode of the e dialogue series with UKRI GCRF Action Against Something Hub. Uh, we uh, recorded our first episodes a few months back, and you can find that on YouTube. We will drop the link in the chat. Today, we are here with Lindsay Hall and Alan Walker to talk about navigating the terrain of infant health, unraveling the gut microbiome's role and roadblocks. And today, we are going to talk more about on the issue and how it impacts child health development. Uh, Professor Lindsay Hall here, who's with us, she has recently been appointed as the Chair of Microbiome Research at the University of Birmingham, and she is also an investigator with Welcome. Her lab's research focus involves defining the microbes or the microbiota interactions during the early life developmental window in infants, and prior to joining Birmingham, she was the chair of intestinal microbiome at the Technical University of Munich, Germany. Um, Alan today here, he's with us. He is the senior research fellow at Robert Institute University of Aberdeen, and he is also the theme lead uh, gut microbiome at UKRI Action Against Stunting Hub. He is a senior lecturer and principal investigator at the Institute at University of Aberdeen. And in his lab, his team combines the anaerobic microbiology with DNA sequencing technologies, and they aim to examine the interactions between the host's diet and the microbiota of humans and animals, and how these factors can contribute to the health of the host. And at the hub, he helps us understand how these mechanisms can impact stunting in children across the different countries that we work with. So thank you so much for taking out the time, Lindsay and Alan, to be here today. And I would like to give the floor to you um, and begin with the discussion. So Alan, would you like to begin first and then we can carry on? Sorry, I think Lindsay is going to give us the first talk to give us an outline and then I will follow, sorry. Lindsay, go on. Perfect. Hopefully everybody can see that. Great. So thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm really pleased to be here and good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on depending on where you're joining from. Um, so, yeah, so today in the second episode, um, as Alan kind of already alluded to, I'm going to kind of kick things off and just talk a little bit more generally about the microbiome, specifically across the early life developmental window. And I've got a couple of slides at the end for people just to kind of think about some of the kind of potential challenges or roadblocks that might be associated with kind of integrating microbiome into different um, into different studies. So without further ado, I will get started. Um, perfect. So. I probably don't need to say necessarily to this audience, um, given the focus of the of the hub, um, but the first 1000 days of an infant's life is obviously critical for their overall health and well-being. And this is because there's lots of different complex and um, pathways that are being developed to mature. And there's a lot of interplay between these different kind of developmental pathways. Um, and this might be kind of metabolic, endocrine, immune cognitive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is obviously very important from a programming perspective, but one of the other things that kind of co-develops across this 1000 days is the gut microbiome. And that'll be the focus of my talk. Although of course there's other microbiomes. So kind of perinatal as well as birth, longer term um, as well. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of introduction to kind of what happens to the microbiome all across this 1000 day window and what role it actually plays in early life development. So just a little bit of introductory slides and apologies for those of you that are well familiar with the microbiome. Um, for this, it's just obviously revision, but important to say. Um, so I've, as I've already mentioned, we're gonna focus more on the, on the gut side of things here, but we have microbiome communities uh, both on and within the body. And um, what's important to say is that each of us, unfortunately, from a research perspective, has its own kind of unique microbiome, although, of course, there's attributes that are very much shared between um, different kind of populations and different developmental stages. And I'll talk about some of them in the early life window momentarily. And in terms of all of these microbes are obviously absolutely tiny. We're talking about trillions and trillions. 
But in terms of, I guess, mass, we're talking about maybe 200 to 500 grams that are found in the gut um, at any kind of given time. And although there was initially people saying that we were more microbe than we were human, um, more recently, um, we realized that actually we're, we have about one microbial cell to about one human cell. Um, but I think what's most important to think about here is not necessarily it's a numbers game, but it's the functionality of our microbial residents that's very important for us. And I'll talk about this as we go through. And I know Alan will also talk about more of this in his presentation as well. So this is kind of really what's important. And as I've already mentioned, in terms of the gut is one of the body sites, but really in terms of microbiomes, it's really the most best well studied. But most importantly, because Alan will not highlight it himself, um, is Alan um, and another colleague, Leslie Hoyles, did a beautiful um, short kind of um, perspective for nature microbiology earlier this year. I'd, I'd advise everybody to go and read it because it's really important to kind of, I guess, uh, debunk some of the myths and misconceptions about human microbiome um, and some of the kind of statements that are bandied around and in fact that they're incorrect so please do go and have a read of read of that um because it's an absolutely fantastic perspective and it's a quick and easy read too so there's no excuses for people not to read it so just in terms of a little bit of definitions and again apologies for those of you that are quite familiar about with the microbiome but one of the things i just wanted to highlight here is of course it's science we like jargon but the term microbiota when i use that term what i really mean is the actual physical microbes themselves but when I maybe use the term microbiome, that's more in terms of the genomic material and also the metabolites that they produce. So this is more about the functionality in terms of what they actually do. So just kind of as a brief introduction there. So in terms of the development of the microbiota, and we are going to talk mostly about early life. So the composition of our microbial kind of residence, it changes right across the life, life course. And that's due to numerous different external and also internal factors too. And I will touch on some of them momentarily. But it's just to say that actually, if you then sampled your gut microbiota on a daily basis, it will probably change. It may not change that much, although although it may change quite substantially if there's been big influences. And in fact, it might even change on, a, on an hourly basis as well. So in terms of us providing a home for residential microbes, what do they do for us? Well, they do a whole raft of different beneficial functions, and I've just got three of them highlighted here. So they're absolutely essential for programming the immune system. Of course, this is very important in early life. They're very important for maintaining the gut or the intestinal barrier and a healthy and I guess strong gut barrier is really fundamental for many different kind of health attributes. And of course, critically and in the context of kind of nutrition, diet and malnutrition, they play a really fundamental role in digesting the food that we eat. And particularly in early life, this is their role with digesting specific kind of sugars, particularly in breast milk called human milk oligosaccharides. And I'll talk about them just in a moment. They also do a number of other um, functionalities for us as well, potentially even in terms of cognitive development, um, but I guess gut barrier, immune system and digestion, again, are the guess the best well characterized. So just to give a little bit of introduction to kind of what we expect to see in a full term, vaginally delivered and breastfed infant is the fact that we actually get vertical transmission of bacteria from mum to baby, during natural childbirth. And there will be transfer of potentially skin and vaginal microbes, but actually the gut microbiome from mum is probably the most important source for passing on certain types of microbiota that might be bifidobacterium and bacteroides. But initially, I guess the first colonizers in the infant gut are those microbes, what we call facultative kind of anaerobes. And what I mean by that, and again, apologies for those of you who know what that term is, is basically they're able to basically live in an atmospheric or oxygen kind of rich environment versus an environment that does not have any oxygen. So kind of the gut being an anaerobic environment. But initially, straight after birth, the gut does have residual oxygen. So these microbes are very important for removing that oxygen from that environment and creating a more favorable environmental niche for other anaerobes that don't like oxygen. So strip anaerobes for coming into the system. So, and I've already kind of mentioned this, one of the really key things during early life is diet. 
and breastfeeding encourages dominance of a particular group or genera of bacteria called bifidobacterium. And that's because these bacteria have the enzymes encoded in their genomes that can break down the human milk oligosaccharides, very specific sugars that you get in maternal breast milk. And because they're able to break down these sugars very effectively, this basically gives them a competitive advantage in this kind of initiating early life ecosystem. So bifidobacterium is very much dominant across the breastfeeding period. But when we start to get other food coming in at the point of kind of weaning or complementary feeding, we start to see other bacteria kind of starting to bloom. And that's again linked to the dietary kind of milieu that is present in the gut. So bacteroides, bacteroides and clostridium would be some examples. Roseburia, Fecalibacterium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's many others, There's basically an explosion in microbial communities at that kind of um, weaning window. And the other thing I just wanted to quick briefly highlight here is that breast milk being an excellent source of dietary components and of course immune modulatory components and lots of other components is actually a source of beneficial bacteria as well. So actually mum breastfeeding not only provides kind of nutrients for her baby's microbes, but also seeds her baby with additional microbes as well. So just important to highlight that. However, one thing that's fundamentally important is to say that most of the knowledge that we have so far from what we expect in healthy, full-term, vaginally delivered breastfed babies is um, from high income countries, we have much, much less knowledge about what is seen in low to middle income countries. And of course, that's very important. So the early life period is obviously critically important. Um, and one thing I just wanted to highlight here, and I've just realized I've been talking there and you've been seeing my face and apologies and not seeing all the slides, um, is number of factors can disrupt these burgeoning kind of infant microbial communities. And some of these might be, and I've already kind of alluded to the fact that diet is important. So if a baby's formula fed, they don't have the same numbers of bifidobacterium as breastfed babies. If a baby's born by cesarean section, this obviously means that vertical transmission does not happen and they've got a very different microbiome. Antibiotics have a big influence here as well. And also when a baby is born. And of course, all of these things is also a very important in the context of malnutrition and also stunting. But I won't say any more on this because this is what Alan's covering in his presentation. And just very briefly, I wanted to highlight kind of how this differences in terms of external factors and what this might do to the microbiome from a very specific example in some of the work that we've done, plus others. And I want to tell you a little bit about premature birth. So these are babies that are born less than 37 weeks gestation. They're often very low birth weight and about one in nine live births globally are defined as preterm. Mm -hmm. Because the babies are born early, the gut is obviously not developed properly. And also they won't have had the same length of time to kind of develop their immune system. Many of these babies are born by cesarean section. They also get many antibiotics. And of course, these are some of the factors I've already mentioned that may inf negatively impact the starting microbiome. And this is very much true because preterm babies often lack characteristic microbes we would see in full-term babies like bifidobacterium, whereas they might have an overgrowth in other bacteria that might be seen to be pathogenic or may cause problems, potentially pathobionts. And this is very important because one of the main roles that bifidobacterium also plays in their life gut is colonization or infection resistance. So if we're missing this particular bacterium, this is why we might be getting overgrowth of potentially pathogenic bacteria. And this is a big problem for preterm babies and a particular condition called necrotizing enterocolitis. So one of the ways that you can potentially remodulate or reboost the preterm gut microbiome is potentially kind of make this into more of a healthy or full term gut microbiome with enhanced colonization or infection resistance. So one of the ways that you could potentially do this is by supplementing or giving back the bacteria that the preterm babies are missing. And in this case, bifidobacterium would be a classic example of being able to do this. And I've already kind of alluded to this um, already, um, but bifidobacterium are one of the first colonizers in early life and throughout the life course, but they're found at very high levels during birth. This kind of um, overlaps with the immune priming window. It's associated with healthy babies. And again, this is linked to the fact that bifidobacterium is exquisitely um, evolved to be able to utilize human milk oligosaccharides in breast milk. 
from our, I guess, translational perspective, this is beneficial because probiotic bifidobacterium have been used for many years and been known to be safe. So we can potentially move very quickly into the clinic if you use these specific probiotic bacteria. But the problem for bifidobacterium is it's um, this group of bacteria is very, very kind of susceptible to different external factors like antibiotics and like changes in diet. And again, as I've already mentioned, low levels of BIF is characteristic of preterm babies and it has been linked to different conditions. So we've done studies as of others, and I won't kind of labor the point because you can go and read it for yourselves. But what we found was that if we kind of re-supplemented bifidobacterium into preterm babies that don't have bifidobacterium, we get a bloom in this beneficial bacteria that actually links with a concurrent reduction in um, pathogenic species. And this was all linked to the fact that this bifidobacterium was able to use the early life diet, so human milk oligosaccharides in the breast milk, which actually meant the metabolites being produced like acetate and lactate were able to reduce the pH in the preterm gut and make it a less hospitable environment for pathogenic bacteria to grow. And so this is a case of giving the right bif with the right diet. And importantly, um, we weren't able to just change the microbial ecosystem, but we were also able to show that by just giving bifidobacterium back to these preterm babies, we're able to reduce the incidence of infection and necrotizing enterocolitis by over 50%. And that's the paper there if anybody wants to read it. So just the last um, two slides um, is just, I want, in terms of, I guess, some of the roadblocks or challenges of doing kind of microbiome um, side of things, particularly in the early life window, it's clearly budget is always a consideration, as is your study population. Um, and this kind of obviously goes interchangeably, but you do really need to think about this very carefully for both. You also need to think about how long you maybe want to be looking for, what samples you want to collect, what the timings are who, where, endpoints and metadata. And of course, critically, you need to think about ethics, but also thinking about recruitment and how you're gonna make sure that you've got people that want to be part of the study. And maybe if it's long, longitudinal, how you keep them part of the study longer term. Because you're dealing with the microbiome, there's huge numbers of confounding factors that I've already mentioned that are really important to consider. And this is why sample size and power calculations for these types of studies are very important. And actually, just to highlight, um, at the Quadram Institute, where I'm also a group leader, they've also come up with a list of, I guess, standard operating procedures that you should be thinking about if you want to design microbiome studies. And one of these relates to sample size and power calculations. So do go and visit the website and do let, download um, these. So I guess one thing I just wanted to highlight before I finish off is how we establish um, causal contributions of the gut microbiota and the development of human diseases. So... One of the issues, as I've already mentioned, is that each one of us has a microbiome that's like a fingerprint. And this is a big issue because it, it raises the risk of obtaining false positives. So seeing something in the data that isn't actually there. So that's really important to make sure that we can control for confounders and covariates. But this does limit our ability to identify causal rather than just association relationships. The issue with multifactorial conditions, like potentially necrotizing enterocolitis, which I briefly introduced, and Alan will talk about a little bit more, but maybe stunting is another multifactorial condition that makes it quite difficult to tease apart these microbiome contributions during early life. So it's very important to make sure you enumerate or you think about these um, different variables and confounders for downstream statistical analyses. And also thinking about how diet might be playing a role. Early life might be a bit easier because it's kind of an early life diet. It might just be um, breast milk. And also for actually kind of showing kind of causal um, relationships, also moving beyond kind of the clinic or beyond populations, actually testing out your hypotheses using in vitro or in vivo models. And it's really essential that you understand the variation, particularly in the early life window. So you can basically understand what's happening to come up with something that's much more effective from a um, perspective of translation or moving more into kind of policy or moving into more kind of therapy development. And I will end on that because I'm conscious that I'm a little bit over time and I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. And thank you very much. Thank you for that amazing presentation, Lindsay. Now, over to you, Alan. We would love to listen to you now. Okay, thanks very much, Chica. I'll just uh, share my screen. Right, and share that. 
And hopefully you can all see that okay. I go back to the start. All okay? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lindsay, for that super um, leading into what I'm going to talk about. That's really great. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the specific links between the microbiota and stunting, <clears throat> which is what we are studying as part of the UKRI Action Against Stunting Hub, um, just driven this call. So um, just as a little bit of background for people who may not be familiar, um, stunting and undernutrition are hugely significant problems of global importance. Um, like I say, this affects millions and millions and millions of kids around the world, primarily in parts of Africa and in Asia. Um, it leads to the death of millions of children every year. It's an absolute tragedy for these countries and on a personal level. Um, and even when non-fatal, um, the poor nutritional status and growth trajectories of these children can actually lead to um, basically permanent irreversible impacts on their development, on their cognitive abilities. Um, and like I say, this 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 sort of sub-lethal um, nutritional problem is very widespread. Um, possibly 20, 30% of the world like children suffer from this. So it's a huge problem for the world and something that really we need to tackle quite urgently so that people can reach their full potential. And so um, obviously with undernutrition, not having enough food can be a major driver. But what's really important for this talk is to appreciate that it's not always a case of just not having enough food. There's a number of other factors that can also play a role. And I've, I've listed a few of them on the slide there. And that includes pure sanitation, um, exposure to, to nasty pathogens that can cause disease, um, how the infant is fed, lack of breastfeeding, um, how the immune system develops, and things like exposure to toxins in the environment. And what's really important to note is that this can actually be a cyclical process. So the child may be uh, malnourished, which in turn can lead to them having sort of uh, impacts on their immune system, so it's not functioning so well. If their immune system isn't functioning so well, then they're less able to fight off infections with invading pathogenic diseases, which in turn can cause disease, which um, it can um, cause the, the gut to be damaged, and that can impair their ability to absorb nutrients from their foods, which then worsens the malnutrition. So you can get this sort of cyclical process with multiple factors at play. And what's really important for this talk is that the microbiota can plausibly be linked to all sorts of these aspects that are involved in undernutrition. And I will talk through those um, in a minute. Um, now, um, evidence, like I say, over the last few years has really started to accumulate that the microbiota is different in children who are undernourished. Um, and some of the <clears throat> classic signatures of that are that, that that process that Lindsay described of the microbiota maturing over time, that seems to be delayed, that maturation process in undernourished children. Uh, it tends to be reduced diversity in the gut and an increased dominance of some of these nastier pathogens that might lead to disease. Um, and that's been covered by a lot of work in particular by uh, Gordon and co um, in countries um, such as Bangladesh. Um, now, the first sort of causal inference experiments came from work that was done uh, nearly a decade ago, where basically they took fecal samples from children of a healthy weight and fecal samples from children who were undernourished and underweight and the faecal transplant of that into, into mice. And the mice who got the faecal transplants from the healthy children microbiota gained more weight than the mice who received transplants from the children who were undernourished. And so this kind of gave causal inference that the microbiota was doing something or some things that were causing uh, weight gain to increase in people who had a healthy microbiota. And so there are a number of plausible mechanisms for this, um, which I'll very briefly cover um, in the next few minutes. The first is um, the ability of our microbiota to help us extract more energy and nutrients from our diet. And that primarily occurs via the breakdown of dietary fiber. And so what, what would normally happen is when we eat fiber, um, that passes straight through our small intestines because we lack the enzymes required to break that down. And instead, it passes into the colon, where the vast majority of our microbiota is. And there, the microbes can actually colonize the fiber, break it down, these complex carbohydrates get broken down to simpler sugars, and then these are fermented anaerobically, because these are anaerobes that dominate in the gut, into what are called short-chain fatty acids. And the nice thing about short-chain fatty acids is, is that's kind of a payback we get from having the microbes in our gut. So we absorb those short-chain fatty acids across um, our gut epithelium, and actually we can gain energy from them. And it's known that the cells that line the colon 
they get about 70% of their energy needs from just one of these short chain fatty acids, which is called uh, butyrate. And so what this does is, in effect, it increases energy yield from the diet. We're able to get some energy from things like fiber, which we ourselves, without our microbiota, would not be able to get any energy from. Now, we're, we're not talking a huge amount. It's maybe 5% of your calories per day. But that's possibly higher in people consuming a very high fiber diet and could potentially be very, very critical, even though small number of calories every day could be really important for children, especially in a sort of malnourished sort of environment. So one way in which we can use our microbiota to kind of improve gut health is via um, increasing um, energy production. Um, the microbiota, by basically breaking down the plant fiber, also plays an important role in releasing a lot of beneficial compounds that are in that plant. So things like phytochemicals that could be anti-inflammatory, for example. If we didn't have the microbiota, those fibers would just pass straight through us. And by breaking the plant fibers down, we can actually absorb those and benefit from them. The flip side is the microbiota can also release or activate toxins that might be present in the plant. And so it, it, it's both a beneficial thing and also a potential negative thing, this impact of the microbiota on plants. And finally, from a nutrition point of view, it's known that the microbiota can make a number of vitamins. And that includes vitamin K and some of the B group vitamins, and we can actually absorb those. And so, again, that can help the child with their developing micronutrient status as well. Um, the other key way in which the microbiota can play a role is in protecting us against um, pathogenic bacteria, germs that are in the environment. And so it's known that the microbiota actually is a really, really potent barrier against invading pathogens. So if you, if you kind of think from the perspective of an invading pathogenic microbe, uh, if you're swallowed by someone, you don't just end up in a gut with the place all to yourself and cause havoc. You have to compete with literally trillions of other bacteria that are going to fight with you for nutrients, for space and all sorts. So this process is called colonization resistance. And essentially it's the ways in which our microbiota protects us as a host. So as kind of illustrated in this very, very complicated schematic here, it's a very multifactorial process. Our microbiota can do things like block binding sites in the gut for pathogens. It can exclude them. They can compete for nutrients. Some microbiota species make antibiotics that kill off pathogens. Um, and others can do things like stimulate the immune system to make our body more able to fight off pathogens or strengthen um, our barrier, which I'll talk about in a little second. So what is known is that different microbiota compositions and as Lindsay said, these vary massively from person to person, can really um, impact on our susceptibility to infectious disease. So again, if, if a child, as they, as they grow, has a very strong and uh, um, robust microbiota, that is likely to help protect them against invading pathogens in the environment. Um, now, this is particularly uh, important in the context of stunting uh, in, in, because of uh, a, a condition that it develops called environmental enteric dysfunction, or EED. And so what happens in this is this is kind of um, it happens a lot in, in populations where people are exposed at kind of low levels to contaminated food and water. So people will continually consume these potential nasty um, contaminant bacteria. And although they don't cause diarrheal disease, uh, they can set up shop in the gut and cause a sort of low level subclinical intestinal inflammation. Now that inflammation can essentially over time damage the intestinal epithelium. So over here, you can see a normal intestinal epithelium. These you see these villi, these are these finger-like projections that go out into the gut and they absorb nutrients from, uh, from what we eat in our diet. And with EED, you can see these villi get blunted a bit. They, 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 they lose the surface area and they're less able to absorb uh, nutrients food, minerals, and vitamins from the uh, from what we consume. And so that can lead to this chronic malnutrition, the stunting I talked about earlier, um, things that are then developing like such as anemia, impaired cognitive development, and even things like uh, reduced um, effectiveness of things like vaccines. So this, this, this EED um, condition can really have quite significant effects for the infant. And again, colonization resistance might help this developing in the first place, by essentially kicking out some of these low-level pathogens that are causing the inflammation. Um, another way in which the microbiota might be able to help with EED is that it um, actually can uh, have a lot of impacts on the immune system, as, as Lindsay uh, mentioned in her talk. Um, and so, importantly, it's now appreciated that some of the species in our gut seem to be pro-inflammatory. Now, that might be good if you're trying to kick out a pathogen. It might trigger the immune system, but it might also be bad if you have uh, EED because it might worsen the inflammation and worsen that blunting of the villi and ruin your absorption even more. Um, 
On the flip side, some species are known to be anti-inflammatory and they actually just calm down and chill out the immune system and like, basically stop overreacting so much. So again, if you had more of these species in EED, it might potentially help reduce some of that inflammatory damage in the gut. So if we talk about one of the roadblocks to, to progress in this area, it really is not well understood at this moment which species are likely to be most important from a pro or anti-inflammatory effect, particularly in the context of um, EED or stunting. And as Lindsay alluded to, one of the main barriers is just simply there's just not enough research being done in populations where this condition is really prevalent. So we need a lot more research to try and get towards that. Um, it's not just the species that are important for the immune system. The short chain fatty acids, for example, that they create, particularly butyrate, are also important on the immune system. Um, and, and butyrate in particular is, 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 is well established to be anti-inflammatory. So again, increased butyrate production could potentially have a role in reducing some of that inflammation and damage in the EED, EED gut. And finally, um, as, as Lindsay also alluded to, the microbiota is really important for fortifying our mucosal barrier. So by feeding it with these short chain fatty acids, they help it to grow. They stimulate uh, growth of new cells. They stimulate production of antimicrobials. They stimulate production of mucin. And all of this acts to try and fortify the barrier and stop some of these potential nasty bugs crossing over and cause disease. So multiple ways there in which the microbiota could be influencing the immune system of the developing infant um, as they are weaning and getting older and dealing with the world around them. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you now that there are numerous ways the microbiota might be important. And so the next question then goes, well, can we harness the microbiota to try and reduce the risk of malnutrition and stunting? And so there are a number of ways that can be done to change the microbiota, and Lindsay alluded to a few as well. First is probiotics give um, the consumer some beneficial microbes and hopefully have an effect. Um, and Lindsay, of course, gave the example of bifidobacteria in her talk. You could also feed people a diet that supports a more healthy microbiota. And there are now sort of efforts, um, done by Jeffrey Gordon and others, trying to provide microbiota targeted dietary to try and really um, boost the beneficial microbes in the guts of developing infants. Um, things like prebiotics, these are fibers that are added to diet, which are designed to stimulate the growth of beneficial microbes. And of course, there's things like targeted antibiotic treatments. I think a key roadblock if we're talking about them in the context of stunting is at this point in time, there's not yet very much in the way of human interventional trials done in the context of you know countries where stunting is really prevalent. So that's something that is coming and will, uh, more will be coming out over the next few years, but that really is a roadblock we have to get past before we can get towards therapeutics. However, there is proof of concept for a range of other conditions, um, and I've given some examples here on the slide, such as C. difficile infection can be very, very effectively treated by using fetal transplants. Lindsay gave the example in her talk of using uh, bifidobacteria probiotics to reduce the amounts of necrotizing enterocolitis in premature infants. And there was a very nice study done in India looking at a combination of probiotics and prebiotics. It's called a symbiotic, which was able to reduce the amount of sepsis uh, in infants in rural India. So again, there's some very promising hints that there is a lot of potential in using the microbiota to reduce some of these disease incidences. Okay, and so then just to wrap up with my last slide, just to summarize, hopefully I've convinced you now that the microbiota may be an important player in the development of childhood stunting and undernutrition. And there's lots of evidence for connections between what we eat, the microbiota and subsequent health outcomes. Um, I give a very brief overview of the potential mechanisms that could be involved um, in, uh, in helping to either uh, protect children from stunting or rather not make it worse. Um, and so, yeah, they're on the slide there, but essentially energy harvest, protection against invading pathogens, stimulating the immune system and neutralization of things like antinutrients and toxins. But as I said in my talk, the big roadblock, we need to do a lot more research to conclusively prove the real links here and what are they going to be the most likely um, target points that we could aim for for interventions to help improve the health of children. Um, to that end, um, there are now a number of human trials underway, and that includes work that we're doing in the Action Against Stunting Hub. Um, and so, you know, although effectiveness has yet to be determined at this point, it's a really exciting time for the field. And I really hope that over the next few years, we will start to get towards um, interventions that may help eventually reduce this burden of stunting, which really is, like I say, a massive and really disgraceful uh, worldwide problem. Um, and with that, um, I will wrap up the slides um, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alan, for that presentation. And for taking up the questions, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, first question comes from Ray, who is asking, can aflatoxin mycotoxins in pregnancy damage gut development in a way that affects colonization after birth, like either directly or by causing premature birth? So I don't know, do you want, do you want to address that one, Lindsay, or do you want me to have the first go? <laughs> You have the first go, Alan, I'll follow up. Okay, perfect. So, I mean, I'd say, there, to my mind, there's not a huge amount of information on how that affects the colonization of the baby, um, at least from the microbiota point of view. Certainly with, with mycotoxins, um, the microbiota can actually release those. <laughs> so a lot of those are bound by the plant um, as they grow. And then when that's consumed, the microbiota chops those off and then releases them and activates again and cause problems. So... Um, actually, with mycotoxins, microbiota might not always be a useful thing to have in that case. How that affects colonization, though, I have to be honest and say that's that's not something I've I've ever researched and aware of. Maybe Lindsay has more. No, I was I was going to say that I guess maybe one of the things if the toxins are also causing like kind of damage, then there would be inflammation, which alludes back to mm -hmm. Alan's point about how, how that can kind of change the environment in the gut, and that would then influence what microbes are able to survive in that environment. And unfortunately, in a pro-inflammatory gut. That's normally all of the entropathogens that you don't want, which are linked to kind of, I guess, stunting as well in terms of um, not not normal development. So, but again, that's probably something else that needs to be researched. And I think people have looked at it, but they, they've certainly, or if they have, they maybe looked at it kind of more just in adults, but they haven't necessarily looked at it across that maybe pregnancy and then early life phase as well. And again, for areas where the where that's much higher, um, that would be something that would be really important to look at. So yeah, thanks thanks for the question because it's just made me think about stuff as well now. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, another question is from Molly Miller. Um, they have asked, are bacter bacteriosins being researched as therapeutic alternatives to antibiotics? Are they able to be isolated or do the bacteriosin producing bacteria have to be administered as probiotics? Yeah, I can I can have a first go on that one. Yeah, that's fine. So, um, yes, there is lots of research into um, bacteriosins that absolutely around the world actually, um, and it's certainly. I mean, we're also doing some of that work ourselves at the Rowe Institute, and and we find lots and lots of um, gut bacteria that are able to inhibit pathogens, at least in the lab. Um, it's not a rare commodity. Um, Unfortunately, what actual compounds they're making <laughs> is not really uh, defined in most cases. You know, as, as Lindsay said, the bacteria are literally making millions and millions of metabolites. And so trying to work out, um, you know, what these actual compounds are is very difficult. Um, but there are certainly other groups who have developed particular um, compounds and they've isolated the compound and worked out what it is. Um, and they would like to use those as antibiotics, yes. Um, the answer to your second question, do you isolate the bacteriosin or do you give a probiotic? I guess both approaches are, are plausible. And certainly, yeah, there, there are groups looking to have the, the bacteriosin as a novel compound that could be given as an antibiotic. But likewise, there are groups who are looking to develop and have probiotics who have these sort of beneficial activities, such as um, firing out bacteriosins that can kill pathogens. So yes, yes, and yes is the answer to all of your questions. I, and I don't know if that's, Molly Molly that we both know Alan or if it's another Molly Miller um so hi if it is if it is Molly hi um so I guess just to follow up from that and actually I guess doing the purification or kind of a bug that produces it I guess it depends on where the infection is because of course you'd probably want a purified bacteria and if you've got bacteremia because it's going to be quick and effective so again what Alan's point about the kind of you could do both I think one of the other things actually about maybe kind of food security as well is actually the purification of the bacteria since is potentially helpful because that's something that actually is used in food production because you can actually use that to get rid of like either spoilage organisms or foodborne pathogens as well because you can spray them over it's not antibiotics which is not what you want but it's bacteria since that are much more targeted as well so that's another kind of use for them kind of I guess earlier on I guess in the food chain in terms of before they come into come into there and I think there was a uh, so not a really cool paper that was Nature Microbiology yesterday that looked across the gut microbiome and all of the different bactericins that could be produced from there. So I think it's an absolutely fantastic, I was going to say untapped, that's not fair 
It's getting tapped resource at the moment, but I think it's something that's going, <laughs> thank you. Um, is something that um, yeah would be really cool to kind of have a look at. So yeah. Thank you both for that answer. Now Anne has their hand up. I'll let you ask your question. You can unmute now. And you can unmute and ask your question if you want to. You have your hand up. Yeshika, there are other questions. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And you can just drop your question and we'll address it. Um, okay, the, oh, the next question is in the chat, I suppose. I'm sorry, that's why I might have skipped it. Uh, so Farhana says, thank you for the amazing presentation. This concept is very new for me. However, I wanted to know about research on gut microbiota and nutrition status among pandemic birth cohort. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's a really good um, question. So, um, it, it's absolutely right that the pandemic did impact and continues to impact, um, you know, food supply to a number of communities, um, and and probably worsened um, stunting. Um, so, we do have some work in our um, stunting hub looking potentially at the impact of the pandemic, but I know there are other researchers around the world who are also interested. Um, and certainly, you know, if food supply was disrupted less nutrition will go to the children, different types of nutrition will go to the children. So um, yeah, absolutely, it is, um, it is an active area of research and it will um, be super important to, to, to see what we learn from that cohort because yeah, it will probably have lessons for moving forward uh, beyond just you know what happened in this pandemic. Yeah, um, just to follow on from that, fundamentally important and also in terms of what we can learn from this for kind of future preparedness as well for kind of other unfortunately for other pandemics I think is really important and we need to be we need to be careful not to lose sight of that I mean one of the things that I think has happened and I think Alan has said about kind of the work that's been done within the stunting hub is the fact that many of the samples or studies that have been happening have happened and maybe started before mm -hmm. during or continue because of course we still have the pandemic at the moment but as long as we have that data, we can just make sure that we don't ignore it, that that is incorporated into our data analysis, because I think we'll be able to get some really important findings from that going forward. And I think, again, people like yourself kind of, you know, saying what about this or think about it, I think it's really important to make sure that that's the, at the forefront of our mind as well, certainly for for, for one of our studies, I mean, that, that was, we kind of started that before and then it's kind of gone during, but we're now trying to think about how we can integrate that kind of data but if we're doing in a high income country setting, so obviously very different. But again, depending on where you are in terms of what your socioeconomic status as well, again, there would have been issues potentially with kind of access certainly to um, fresh, nutritious food also, as well as Alan has kind of said to us. So something that I think is incredibly important. So thanks for kind of highlighting that. And I think important to keep that very much in the forefronts of kind of everybody's minds as well. I think the other thing with the pandemic is, is it's not just potentially nutrition that's an important factor that's impacted here because, you know, if, if people are in lockdowns, they're mingling less, there's less exposure to the immune system of bacteria, less infections, infection with COVID itself, of course, has impacts on the gut and nutrition. So, yeah, it, it's not just nutrition that the pandemic itself is potentially a hugely um, confounding factor across all sorts of studies. So, yeah, it, as Lindsay says, it's something that will have to be uh, factored into analyses. Yeah. Great, thank you. And there's a follow-up question from Ray. Uh, what is the most likely real-world relevance for gut microbiota for stunting and infant health in next three years? Like, is it, for example, the importance of more care with antibiotic usage? Uh, where can these affect the gut bacteria? Yeah, no, that's that's an excellent question. And I re honestly, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell you an accurate answer. I can only, like you say, give you my 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 rough estimate. Um, I think there, there's multiple areas with potential real world relevant, relevance. The one I guess that's gaining most traction at the moment is in the type of diet that's given to infants as supportive um, as supporting diets. And I guess Dinesh would like to answer that too. So I guess we can let Dinesh speak as well if he wants. Um, and like I say, there are efforts already underway to try and design 
diets um, instead of the sort of traditional RUTF diet, one that is really aimed at promoting beneficial um, gut bacteria. Results from there have come through from pilot studies. You know, they're reasonably promising. They're not like, you know, changing things massively, but they change things a little bit and help. Um, I mean, antibiotics, it's hard to control the use of antibiotics in various settings. They're very easy to buy in various countries in the world. So again, you can tell people, please don't take antibiotics. But you know, if you've got an ill child and you're really worried about uh, the child, it's a natural reaction for a parent to go and get some antibiotics and give it to their child. So I think real world relevance, um, I think a lot of it's going to have to come from government messaging. A lot of it will come from, you know, um, aid agencies trying to provide improved feeding regimes as well. So hopefully that sort of stuff will be the first steps that come along um, over the next few years. But um, yeah, like I say, this is really much uh, crystal ball gazing. So Yeah, I mean, and that absolutely kind of is the whole antibiotic story is kind of, it, it's difficult because you're dealing with a population that the immune system hasn't fully developed yet. So antibiotics are, are are needed as well but obviously in terms of its education and that might be also to healthcare professionals as well and there's lots of different kind of initiatives that are happening around that and also just in terms of engagement there are people don't think that they need to ask for antibiotics that's not necessarily going to be the kind of you know golden solution um, and in terms of the diet stuff I think one of the other things I think is important as well is I think there's now a realization again that donor breast milk banks are also very important for mem maybe potentially my um, fragile infant populations as well so that's one of the things that you know obviously kind of breast milk is good but donor breast milk is also fantastic in terms of them um, the benefits again from a nutritional perspective again from other perspectives as well so I think there's a realization that investment in those I think is really important and that's something that is I guess you could potentially implement much, much more quickly, again, if you get that, as Alan said, kind of government um, investment and kind of, um, and also messaging as well. Um, and again, just kind of thinking about kind of just nutrition more generally about what, I mean, we all know why it's important, but maybe actually kind of increasing that kind of education to the fact that nutrition is not just important for you, but it's probably much more important for your gut microbes as well. I think that's something else in terms of that engagement more at kind of, you know, community level public level is really important as well so yeah neither of us have crystal balls 50 million things that need to be done mm -hmm. but it's exciting space yeah and yeah i had a thought i have a question like i think this is a follow-up to this one again uh because you did point out that this is a developing area of research and the effectiveness will be pointed out in the next few years so while this is happening and it really impacts the gut health of adults as well and as well as infants and their development so do you have any opinions or ideas about how can the policy and the research gaps can be balanced meanwhile how do the researchers and the policy makers come together develop an understanding and continue forward while we are still understanding how this unfolds in research. Okay, so, uh, so I think one of the nice things from a microbiota point of view is that quite a lot of the general advice we would give now actually meets existing policy. <laughs> so, you know, existing policy is for most people, not for every person, because now some people are intolerant, but more fiber consumption, more grains, and, you know, for, for reasons not linked to the microbiota, such as, you know, heart disease protection, et cetera. But actually, that advice turns out to be pretty good advice for the microbiota, too. Um, and so policy wise, I don't think it changes major messages too much, but it perhaps refines them and adds an extra layer of support for them. Um, and I guess I, I see a couple of questions from Ray related to that point, asking, well, what kind of feeding suggestions? And so, I mean, you know, Normally it would be, yeah, brand beans, greens, yes, a, a variety of different fibers to support a variety of different um, microbes and really promote that diversity. Um, I know Ray has also asked um, about whether bran is not good if you want to lose weight. I, I really want to get across that bran, uh, that, sorry, that, that energy extraction from fiber is a small component of calories per day. Like I say, no more than 5% usually in most people. Um, and eating things like bran and fiber has other effects like satiety so it makes you feel more full makes you eat less so again some of the effects of eating it's it's nothing to do with the microbiota i think i'm a gut microbiologist i love we're studying the microbiota but i think there is a tendency to perhaps overstate the importance sometimes it doesn't 
account for everything. There are other factors at play here. And again, things like eating bran, it's not just the microbiota, it's the fiber itself that's having impacts on satiety. So um, yeah, so that was a sort of detour to answer these questions. Uh, Lindsay, you may want to go back and touch on policy um, beyond what I've said. No, I mean, I think what you said is really important, Alan. That, and the nice thing is I don't think we're, we're, we're not starting from nothing. We're actually and I think the most effective ways to integrate with current policies, it's much easier to get that messaging kind of around and actually then maybe just giving further, I guess, credibility or further evidence for why that policy probably was there in the first place. Probably the microbiome was always very important. We just didn't know it was really important within that context. So that's really, really helpful. I think one of the things, though, is, again, for the policy is kind of getting the policymakers like engaged and interested. So, again, that's why having more transdisciplinary groups like your particular group is really important because you need to get the ear of the people to be able to kind of move things through into kind of policy or clinical practice for example so again as scientists um i think it's really important that we kind of look up to make sure that we are kind of engaging with the the right individuals to be able to kind of move that forward and i think it, your comment as well about, you know, things are being developed and how are we going to be looking at that? One thing that I'm, I forgot to highlight, I think, in my presentation is the Microbiology Society is actually arranging a microbiome safety workshop in January in London um, next year. It's just a closed workshop. Alan's talking at it and I'm chairing at it. There will be some other spin-offs coming out of that. But that's when we're bringing kind of academic policy and industry together to talk about the fact it's a very fast moving field and how do we also put a kind of a regulatory or a policy framework around that to make sure that we're doing things in the right way but also not taking too long that if there's any benefits we don't get it to the people that need it so there's I think there's a, it's a really active area I think it's something that we all need to be thinking of and I think there's kind of it's very much watch this space so so we do have the workshop in January but please kind of keep an eye out, particularly on the Microbiology Society website, because I think there'll be a lot more coming out from that, from that particular workshop. So yeah, thanks for kind of following up with that question. I think it's really important. Okay, yeah, uh, great. And we have a last few minutes left and there is one question from Aleswa. I hope I have pronounced your name right. They say that this can be a reason in our country despite different nutrition intervention has been done and from regions are basket regions that is high food producing regions prevalence of stunting keeps on elevating so can this be one of the causes. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's one of the points I tried to get across in the talk is that and quite often it's not just about food quantity, it's about food quality. But it's also about other things like, you know, prevalence of pathogens in the environment, hygiene. Is, I, I mean, I think there's one thing about stunting. It's super complicated. <laughs> there are many, many factors at play here, of which the microbiota is only one. You know, and again, that's the point I wanted to make in my last answer. Um, again, one of the nice things about the Stunting Hub project we're doing is we're actually trying to address all sorts of these different reasons in one project. And our hope is that when we put that all together at the end, that might identify sort of more important factors that if you're a government trying to introduce policy this might be the thing you want to you know channel resources into first because that's likely to have the biggest impact so yeah like, like i say thank you for the question and and, and yeah i'd I really to emphasize that you know stunting is difficult um there's, there's many different factors at play yeah yeah and as alan said it, it is ne not necessarily about quantity and i guess it normally for these regions it might be very specific things that they are producing right so you don't get the nutritional kind of breadth that you might need to be getting all your different beneficial microbes being able to kind of to, to grow and then provide those metabolites that kind of maintain health as well so that's why i mean this for the stunting hub i think is incredibly important because hopefully you're going to start getting a first insight into some of these different things and also think about what you need to focus on and what future work and who needs to come together as teams as well so i think it shouldn't be just ignored but realize it's it is complicated which means we don't go oh it's complicated we don't do anything we go okay let's figure it out but let's kind of figure it out together moving forward so thanks for kind of highlighting that it's really important so I see Ray has added a bit to chat about the role of the mother's um, health as well. Um, absolutely true. And again, one of the nice things about the hub is we're also monitoring the mothers as well and their environment. So um, I totally agree. Um, you know, a lot of the impact is 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 in, in the womb. It's it's before the baby's even born. So, yeah, it's really important to consider that phase as well. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, totally. And uh, unfortunately, we are near time now. But... Thank you everyone for attending and this has been a very vibrant and this session with full, completely full of discussions. I would welcome the final thoughts from Lindsay and Alan.
and then maybe we can we'll have to unfortunately close the session you want to go I'm first saying, go for it okay. yeah. um <laughs> it's complicated um which of course is rubbish but no i think um, it's the microbiome really, I think, can have a massive impact, but we just need to be careful about not thinking it's going to be the cure-all for everything. Yeah. And there's lots of other factors that are important. And that's why I think working more kind of trans or interdisciplinary is really, really important as well. And everyone just to kind of remember that we all work in our own wee niche, but go and chat to different people to make sure that I think you're going to have a bigger impact as well. And I think just one final thing for me, if you are thinking about doing a microbiome study, and this is why it's fantastic that you've got Alan as part of this in terms of having an expert. But if you don't have that background, please just kind of reach out to kind of microbiome researchers just to make sure that there might be some things you just haven't thought about. It'd be the same as me setting up a study. I won't have thought about everything as well. And it kind of means that you can future proof things as well and think about potential some of the confounders that I missed um, that I rather I mentioned in the talk as well. So do go and have a wee chat with your friendly microbiome microbiologist because um, we're always happy to kind of help and advise going forward. Yeah, no, that's made it easy for me. I'll just uh, echo everything Lindsay just said. <laughs> everything is true. Um, you know, hugely exciting area of research. It takes time. It's hugely complicated. So again, you know, I wouldn't pin, you know, everything on the microbiota. It's not going to be the case. But absolutely, um, I think it's it's plausible that, you know, over the next couple of decades, we'll be looking at more microbiota directed therapies that will have some some impact. Um, so, yeah, no, it's it's promising, hugely exciting. And um, yeah, follow the space. Dinesh, would you like to say any last words? Would you like to add something? I think we had a really amazing presentation and the discussion was very vibrant and lively, both in the chat and the Q&A. And uh, I think uh, one thing I wanted to highlight from Lindsay's presentation is also that there is an increase as healthcare is more and is up getting available better and better to a lot of LMICs. There's an increased number of C-sections which are happening and which has a very direct impact on uh, the my gut microbiota, early formation of gut microbiota. I think uh, as a, from the policy perspective, uh, I'm looking at leaders like you in this area to prop pitch this as one of the effect of increased C-sections in the global policy space. No, really, really good point. And just briefly, I know we're slightly over time, but yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing that goes hand in hand here is C-sections and antibiotics and AMR, because you need to have antibiotics to be able to do C-sections. There's a whole load of other things there. Um, but we do need to be careful that, of course, in many cases, it will be emergency C-section, which, which has to happen potentially rather than elective. And there might be reasons for elective as well. But the one thing is, is that we can figure out C-section if something isn't passed on, well, then it can still be a C-section, but we can just give what might be missing because it hasn't been a natural vaginal birth. And that's why more work around that area is really important and important for us to be aware of this is becoming more common that we need to know that and make sure we start taking the samples and seeing what that might impact on that infant population, both in the short and longer term. So thank you, Dinesh, for highlighting that because I think that's really, really important. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the session. And we will be posting the recording on YouTube soon so you can rewatch the session and share with others. Have a great day ahead. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.